All right, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Lene Erickson. I'm an SVP at Third Way, um, and I'm excited to start this conversation about what progress has been made on guns and where the American people might want us to go further. So um, a new Associated Press poll this morning uh, said that 71% of Americans say that gun laws should be stricter, including about half of Republicans. Um, the vast majority of Democrats and a majority of people in gun owning households. Yet for the past three decades, we've seen countless mass shootings and gun violence um, and so much carnage and Congress had failed to make any progress for three decades. So fast forward to earlier this summer, we finally actually made some progress on guns. So how did it happen? And if we were going to build on that progress, where would Americans want us to go from here? Uh, to get some insight into those questions, uh, I have two uh, people who know this better than anyone else um, on both sides of the aisle. So I'm gonna be joined by Angie Kiefler, who is Senior Vice President of Research at Global Strategy Group. She is a go-to consultant on American attitudes towards guns and gun violence. And uh, she's done research for Giffords, the Brady Campaign, Every Town, the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility's Ballot Initiative, and countless more. And I'm also going to be joined by Robert Jones, who is a partner at GS Strategy Group, a sought-after strategist. Uh, uh, he's worked for the National Republican Congressional Committee, the Congressional Leadership Fund, do, running um, IEs for some of the most competitive races in 2018, um, and now resides at John Cornyn's firm and worked with the Third Way during the bipartisan Senate negotiations to really try to shape those negotiations and understand the views, particularly of Republican voters in key states of the senators that were crafting that compromise. So I'd like to, at this point, invite Robert and Angie to join me. Hey, Lynette, thanks for having us. Thank you. Hello. So let's just start at kind of a 30,000 foot level. You've both done tons of research around Americans' views about a lot of things, including guns and gun policy. Can you just give a couple of high level observations that have shaped how you think about perceptions and the political dynamics on this issue? And Angie, I guess I'll ask you to start. Yeah, I'm um, happy to. And again, thank you for uh, having me. Um, I'm always game to, to talk about this issue. I've been working on it for well over a decade uh, and so have uh, seen a lot of things change uh, for the better and a lot of things uh, rather frustratingly stay the same. Um, in terms of uh, 30,000 foot overarching um, perceptions, uh, my, my perception of this issue is more than any other issue potentially save abortion uh, is that people sort of bring their own backstory uh, bring their own experiences to this issue. You cannot have a policy conversation uh, without someone telling a story uh, about how guns have uh, the role guns have played in their lives, whether for better or for worse. You know, we they you know will talk about uh, growing up and learning how to shoot a gun to go hunting with their families. Um, so they will talk about. Uh, how much they desperately feel that they need a gun to, to protect um, themselves uh, and their families. Um, so you really can't talk about guns um, without acknowledging that um, and not um, soothing some of those fears people may have without um, you know, having that as part uh, of the discussion. Um, so any conversation about policy only um, any message about guns that doesn't um, take that into account and take these sort of bring your own subtext into account really misses voters uh, where they're at. And I think, frankly, over the last decade, the movement has gotten much better at having those different types of conversations. Um, and I, I think that's one of the reasons we've we've gotten to a, a place of being successful um, on a policy standpoint recently. Robert, how about you just thinking about, you know, when you structure a survey around this issue, what are some of the um, underlying foundations you bring to that um, as you're trying to figure out the, the details of where people are in any moment? Well, I think the moment, you know, in which the, the survey takes place, right, surveys are a, a snapshot of a moment in time, 
right? And I think, you know, Angie having done these over years and me having done these over years, we've seen how that's kind of changed, right? There are political earthquakes, right? And I would say kind of the modern, you know, push for gun rights as it were kind of starts in 2012, 10 years ago with Sandy Hook and the Aurora Theater shooting, right? Both have been kind of like six months of each other and moving from there. And then you kind of go from the earthquakes that set things off to the more frustrating part, but usually the part that leads to progress, which is the erosion, right? It's the steady drip, drip, drip of people attempting to make change, people trying to make things happen, new events, you know, influencing how people think about things. And then there finally usually comes to another kind of earthquake moment, right? That happened, I think, in 2022 that kind of led to, you know, this change and round of, of gun talks that was ultimately successful, right? And I think it is, you know, how do you meet voters where they are, right? There's a lot of desire, um, I think, to uh, have the perfect become the enemy of the good often in these scenarios, right? And, uh, and that, that often, you know, can stifle change um, and stifle progress. But I think when, you know, policymakers are willing to compromise and meet voters where they are, or and other policymakers are able to compromise and, and meet voters that may be even further along than they are, I think that's also what happens in this discussion a lot is that voters are, are further along than a lot of elected officials, right? Certainly on the Republican side. And when, you know, Senator Cornyn and other Republicans are willing to go further than they're comfortable with and understanding that to make progress, I think that's when change kind of usually finally happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of compromise, we saw, um, you know, a fair amount of that in the Senate this, this summer on a number of issues, but um, most relevant to this, obviously, uh, the first piece of gun safety legislation that has happened in 30 years since I was, you know, in elementary school myself. Um, so it it provided a lot of funding for states to um, implement red flag laws, to um, fund violence intervention programs, to um, provide community health mental services, um, to provide school support. Um, but it also closed the kind of boyfriend loophole that we um, that we had seen in the background check system. It, had, it made background checks tougher for people between the age of 18 and 21, um, and it made some progress on gun trafficking as well. Why do you think, given your research, that these specific reforms were the ones um, that got through, and, and why do you think you know, these might have succeeded at that moment versus you know, the countless other times we've tried, um, tried and failed? And, and here, I think I'll start with you, Robert. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you look at the, the polling, right, certainly the polling that I did for Third Way, I'm sure Angie's seen it in a lot of the work that she's done. Um, it's overwhelming, right? You just don't see a lot of surveys um, to the numbers you referenced earlier, the numbers we have in our survey where 80% of Americans agree on things, right? And in this case, it was not one thing, right? It's not, you know, just that we need stricter gun laws. It was specific policies, you know, across a number of different issues. You know, they go from background checks to boyfriend loopholes, like you mentioned, red flag laws you know, uh, age limits on, on uh, semi-automatic weapons. So all of those things having really broad appeal um, at the same time, giving, I think, legislators a lot of places to go to, um, to respond to the pressure they were getting from their constituents, right? Usually there's kind of one outlet valve um, for elected officials, and if they can't all fit through there, then nothing happens, right? We had a lot of different off-ramps here um, for elected officials to say, we know we need to do something. We can't all agree on one thing, um, but we have lots of, you know, we have a half a, dozen, half a dozen different options here to choose from and to put together a, a package of things, as you described it, right, um, to make progress on this issue. Um, I agree with all of that. And uh, to expand the conversation a little bit, I think there are certainly pieces of this um, that check a lot of boxes for a lot of different people, right? The red flag laws really connect to a sense of belief that mental illness has some role to play um, in certain uh, mass shootings. Uh, the um, gun trafficking connects to a lot of perceptions on uh, ri rising crime and how to deal with that. So it was a very, very smart mix of policy provisions that, as Robert said, the vast majority of voters support, but bluntly, they support the vast majority of voters support a lot more than this, uh, too, right? So in turn, and they've always supported these things, or at least in the last decade that I've been working on this. So in terms of the why, why now, I have seen I'd say about three things change in terms of how voter the mindsets voters bring to this. First, um, there is a growing sense that 
lax gun laws are actually a problem in America. Um, early on, people would ascribe, early on when I was doing like focus groups uh, in the era of Manchin Toomey, for example, people would ascribe a lot of our gun problems to like lax parenting and video games and things like that. And that is just not the case anymore. There is a growing understanding that we have, prob America has problematic gun laws and a lot of loopholes that need to be closed. Um, second, there's been a shift in the reactions to mass shootings from deep sadness and a uncomfortableness of politicizing to rage and anger and a no, actually, we do need to do something political in response to this. And that's also changed over the last few years. Um, sadness, a very defeating emotion, anger is an activating one. Um, so that gets people um, really, really activated uh, and willing to put pressure on their elected officials on this issue in a way they necessarily haven't done in the past. Third, and this speaks to, to, to what I just said and, and what Robert said about some of these elected officials finally feeling some pressure um, and, and having outlets for that, um, there has been an expanded, and I'll say ex expanded villain for lack of a better word. It used to be a lot of the um, messaging would be around um, how the NRA is bad on this. But a lot of people have a growing realization that in fact, it's our elected officials who have the power to do something about this and have the power to stand up to lobbyists of any kind. And so that's where they're directing their anger in a way they necessarily haven't in the past. So. Those are, I think, are the three like shifts that I've seen in the last 10 years that have really, really allowed this to be, um, you know, allow the straw, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? Allowed this to be the moment um, where something actually got done. And to connect it to, you know, I think the last point that Angie made, right? There is also a change. I think this is similar to the world post Dobbs, which is that I think people's gun positions or elected officials' gun positions, I should say, for certain suburban voters have become disqualifying, yeah. right? And as that starts to build up and, you know, there are suburban voters who are, you know, ruling out voting for certain Republican elected officials by virtue of their position or lack of, you know, uh, desire to make changes to gun laws, that creates action um, in elected officials too, right? They're going to say, okay, I used to be able to, you know, talk about mental health and all these other things that we want to do without changing gun laws. But now there's a big segment of the population that says, you know, I may have been open or I have voted for Republicans in the past, but I will not be voting for Republicans if and until um, they make movement, make progress on, on gun laws. Mm -hmm. So maybe that intensity gap that so long existed mm -hmm. on this is equalized a bit. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, uh, you may or may not know that Third Way um, actually started as a gun safety organization. We, um, uh, our founders uh, had uh, an organization called Americans uh, for Gun Safety. And um, the, one of the things that they did was bring to uh, Senator Tom Daschle at the time, uh, from a Democrat from South Dakota, um, polling that said, um, this is why you're not able to make progress on this issue. So they showed that um, that 90% of people in South Dakota supported background checks. If you just ask them that question, universal background checks. But then if you would um, ask them to Angie's point, um, do you think that um, gun violence is a problem in your community or somewhere else? They would say somewhere else. And if you said, do you think that expanded background checks would reduce gun violence? They would say no. And when you're operating with that, um, that assumption and that intensity of, of pressuring folks just isn't there because it doesn't feel relevant to you or, or like it's going to do anything. So. Right. Um, so if we are in this moment then of, of activating and of people feeling powerful, um, one thing that can help fuel that is to actually see something get done. I know, I know it did for me. I worked with the Sandy Hook families on, as Angie uh, mentioned, Mansion to Me, which was the um, background checks compromise that was put together and then failed in 2013. And that was very deactivating for me. And I had to take a break from working on this issue because it just wasn't something I felt we could make any progress on. Um, but now we saw progress. So do you think there's any capacity then to build on this progress? Um, and if you had to kind of um, advise candidates or policymakers on kind of a roadmap for what's what should come next. Where should they start? Are there are there things that got um, caught from this compromise bill that you think 
um, could be a, a stepping stone for a next set of policies. Um, well, I always go back to a real federal background checks bill on all sales and transfers. Like, you know, I, I, I mention that and I say that and journalists and other people will be like, well, is that so old? Like, you know, haven't voters moved beyond that? I'm like, no, because we don't have it yet. <laughs> so, like, so no, it is still very they're not so old. Yeah, yeah no. exactly. Like this, it, this is still part of the conversation. It is still the thing that there is the most agreement on. It is still the thing that is the most uh, audacious, uh, ad uh, audacious to people that we don't have. Um, and there's a lot of assumptions that we do have it. Um, so I think that is still the place to be. Um, it is still where there is the most massive amount of agreement on all of these things, too. It's higher agreement than anything that passed um, in this uh, bipartisan uh, bill that we just um, we just did. Yeah, and I think taking, uh, you know, maybe even a more incremental approach to that, I think you could take about look at what passed this time, right? You know, I saw someone in the Chad talking about how the boyfriend loophole was narrowed, you know, in this and not like fully closed, right? So there were compromises made to make progress, right? I think it's how do we isolate, you know, the biggest problems within the lack of background checks, right? How is it online sales? Is it, you know, identifying gun dealers, right? Is it peer to peer, right? You know, and so thinking about taking small steps to get to the big step, right? If we're going to be you know, if, if, if it's going to get stymied in terms of background checks on every gun sale, where are the places where we make the most progress um, as it relates to smaller portions of that piece, right? I, I'm with Angie in that it, I, you know, it clearly has the support of voters, right? If there was a national referendum of sorts or a vote, right? It would clearly pass. Um, but since we don't have that option, um, how do we how do we make small progress, right? Going to the the erosion over the over the earthquake. Yeah, Angie, I know you work with, you know, as I said in the intro, uh, approximately every gun group that exists <laughs> that is over the years um, yeah. has influence on this. And, and so you have a real good sense of um, the dynamics of movement and also of the dynamics of other movements you work with. Um, how do you think um, the movement is thinking about kind of small bites versus um, big things and and has that changed over over time? Um, you know, what what is the feeling about the fact that we took some small bites? Does that give an appetite for more or an appetite for bigger? <laughs> what how are people that yeah. work on this every single day? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I think it's definitely something that has evolved over the last uh, decade a bit. Um, I think uh, there was initially a, a real big push for federal legislation, but you know, per Lene, your point, our, all of our experience with Manchin Toomey, um, that felt dang near impossible uh, for a while, given uh, the dynamics of the Senate. Um, there was a movement to uh, do some ballot initiatives, which, which we've done and we're mostly uh, successful on, but that's a bit piecemeal. There's a movement to do more in the states. So, um, I think what has happened as things have frankly gotten harder in the Senate, save this last uh, uh, bill, um, there's been more of a push to do smaller things at the state level. And frankly, in a lot of states, um, push back against uh, uh, efforts to weaken gun laws. There's a lot of states that are actually trying to, even in this moment, weaken the already really weak gun laws uh, that we have. Um, so there's an element that has really um, sort of changed. So it's not just a federal fight. Uh, it is also a, a state and local fight from everything from sheriffs uh, uh, to to um, to governors. Yeah, I think that, the, I think the piece about, you know, I always encourage clients where it's possible, right? I'm, uh, I grew up in Oregon, which has really uh, 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 ample ballot access for initiatives and other things like that, right? And where you can make progress in putting it to voters, right? I think is a really good place to go. Um, even in some of the, the biggest red states where we did surveys in North Carolina and Utah and other places, I have no doubt those would pass um, at statewide ballot levels in those places um, based on our polling. And so I do think that that is a place um, not, in, uh, not, not to supplant federal efforts, but to supplement them. Um, where as possible. So uh, I always have to think about these kinds of issues as I sit in a think tank office um, in the policy wonky way. Um, and you know, the policy wonks who work here with me on a variety of issues are always saying, what do voters think about this super detailed policy that I spend my whole time on? 
And I'm like, they don't, they don't think about that. But um, I'm curious what you all think here, whether the, the details um, really helped um, to get things through or if voters just wouldn't have paid attention either way. So, so for example, I think it was a little harder to caricature this bill as gun grabbing because there was literally no gun grabbing. <laughs> you know, there um, they had taken off the table the idea of um, not allowing access to assault weapons for 18 to 21 year olds, even though, you know, I think that's a hugely common sense policy directly related to a lot of the mass shootings we've recently seen and, and highly popular, but could be characterized as taking someone's gun away. Um, you know, there was money for red flag laws, but there wasn't a mandate for red flag laws. It just, it had a lot of these details. How much do you think that mattered in terms of the public conversation um, and, you know, Republicans um, or even moderate Democrats willingness to kind of go, um, go out on a limb on these things? I think the I think voters' fluency as it relates to uh, gun control is has really grown, right? To your point, you know, the phrases boyfriend loophole, red flag laws, universal background checks, assault weapons ban, right? All of those are are pretty well known by people, which is not the case on every issue area as you go across, you know, the, the spectrum, right? There's a lot of, as we write surveys, and you know, there's a lot of explanation that goes into a lot of these questions, right? To say, you know, the Senate's considering X, which means Y and Z, you have to explain it all. You know, th those phrases for, you know, 80 plus percent of Americans have some meaning and they kind of understand generally what they're trying to do. So that's one thing that's really changed, I think, to the benefit um, of this issue is that people understand it and don't need to, to your point, they're not intimidated by the details anymore, right? Because we've been having a conversation for, again, like I said, probably 10 years since Sandy Hook, um, that people are now understanding what all these things mean. And and can can engage in the details in a way they can in other issues. Yeah, I think the details mattered here the oh. most uh, because of what you alluded to, Lene, in that it took a lot of the top hits off the table. Um, it, uh, like I I think if you ask and I have I think if you ask voters like in focus groups, you know, tell me what about this bill you like, they wouldn't be able to say much. Like there's just not that level of awareness, but from a political context, um, it takes away a lot of the negative mm -hmm. um, that can be deployed about it from quote unquote gun rights groups. Now they'll still try with red flag laws that often uh, falls a bit flat. And I think it also provided, and Robert could probably speak to this more, um, an off ramp for Republicans to talk about their school support programs, right, and and some of uh, some of it as it relates to that. So, I think it was. I leave to how smart on various policy levels to the to the policy people. I think it was smart in that the messaging that it lends itself to in a political midterm context. Yeah, I think there. I think there is a little bit. You know, uh, again, ultimately, not that many Republicans voted for it. Enough voted, but not that many, right? I think a lot of them you know, may not face voters again, right, which probably impacted some of their thinking. But, you know, uh, to, to Angie's point, there is, you know, really the concern on the right that it goes too far. And then I think ultimately, too, on the left, that it doesn't go far enough, right? And that, you know, people like Chris Murphy standing up and saying, okay, I'm willing to not take everything I want um, to get this done. And also, you know, all the Democrats who did vote for it, even knowing that their primary voters probably likely wanted them to go much further than this, right? Um, and to stand up and say, we want to go further, but not again to allow the the perfect to become the enemy of the good is a, is an important you know a mental barrier to cross right in this discussion right that doesn't get crossed all the time on every issue, and and one that was fairly courageous for the senator who represents the Sandy Hook families to take. Mm -hmm. Um, so I see that we're already getting some great questions in the, in the Q&A box. I'll encourage folks to continue to add to that, and I'll work some of those in here. But um, we've all referenced the midterms. The election is 11 weeks away, uh, I saw in Playbook this morning, and then I wanted to die because that sounds like a really long time to keep having this conversation. But here we are, um, and I'm sure your guys' next 11 weeks will be fairly busy. Um, but it, staring down this midterm election um, and, and knowing that you both are going to be working for candidates and races, what, if any, impact do you think this conversation around gun safety will have in key races? Um, and, and, you know, do you think the fact that 
um, this bipartisan bill was passed is going to be a factor in any of those places. Angie, I'll, I'll throw this to you to start. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think, look, um, Democrats are obviously on the defense when it comes to the economy. Um, and, and frankly, they they should be. We're, you know, at the at the helm and people are, are suffering, suffering. And so we should have conversations about that. Um, and we're certainly telling, you know, our candidates to do that, uh, frankly. But um, that's not the only thing uh, voters care about, especially in a time where people are concerned about uh, rising crime and especially rising gun crime. They're, they're experiencing that uh, in a more personal way than they have uh, that I, than I've ever seen before. Uh, so there is an increased saliency uh, on the importance of, of gun reform. Um, further, like a complaint we hear, I'm sure Robert hears about it all the time too from voters, is that Congress can't get anything to do anything done. There's no working together. There's no listening to what people need. Well, here's tangible proof that uh, in fact, um, something can get done uh, and that there is this accomplishment. So frankly, I do think it's an opportunity for Democrats to um, both go on the off go on the offense on something that voters really care about what really care about. Yeah, I'm perhaps like, you know, a little bit more cynical in the length of memories of voters, right, which is to say, I think it's going to have, you know, it, it will provide for those who want to use it and engage with it, right, in terms of advertising, it will have some impact. But if but for those who don't, I think it will be largely absent from the discussion, right, you know, there's, I think, to, to Angie's point, the economy is sort of the overriding thing that is happening and then but then as you look at secondary issues i even think that reproductive rights you know and gun control had been sort of neck and neck as we were going through the spring and 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 fall and i think clearly now after the Dobbs decision reproductive rights have eclipsed uh uh gun control and and, and legislation in terms of importance with voters right and so i think that's where you will see from Again, most of the ads from you know the next eleven weeks will be negative in nature, uh, not positive, and they I think likely the contrast will be drawn you know for uh, for the districts where and states where it's uh, where it's useful for Democrats on reproductive rights. I think you're seeing that already um, in terms of the issues that they're using to other than the economy to sort of separate um, Republicans from suburban voters. So one of the great questions we have in the chat here. Um, notes that the um, uh, many of the Republicans, at least in the Senate, um, who voted for this bill are retiring, and um, you know that might present a hurdle for for further progress. But um, but some of them aren't. Um, and do you see any backlash um, or or worry that um, kind of the Republican base? Um, is going to come after those remaining non-retiring Republicans. How do you think, Robert, that um, the, the dynamics in on the more right-leaning side of, of the ledger are playing out? Well, again, going back to the kind of the short memory of voters, I think that for the most part, um, that, it, it, that question has been asked and answered and that I think all the Republicans who voted for it are going to be fine, right? And that is something I'm Courage and tell people as I, you know, look at survey results, the surveys we did for you all, is to say there is not a real risk of backlash, right? It is, it is limited to a very small segment of the electorate, and maybe that's a larger segment of the primary electorate uh, for Republicans. But I still think it's it's a minority of Republican primary voters who are so outraged about this bill that was passed that they're going to likely, you know, throw out an incumbent Republican. I just think that's very unlikely, um, mostly because they're not going to see any impact in their own life. Right. Uh, these bills are unlikely on a day to day basis on a, you know, you know, weapon to weapon ownership. You know, if, you, if you're a person who owns multiple weapons and legally and you're using them legally and lawfully, you're going to see likely no impact. Right. And I think that that is probably first and foremost why uh, none of these Republicans or very few of these Republicans if any, will see any real backlash from voters in a primary, you know, that. Most of them, except for you know maybe New Hampshire, I think at this point have survived, right? So they, you know, we're eighteen you know months away from another primary election, and I think that will be um, far in the rearview mirror by then. Yeah, to your point, voters have very short memories now, <laughs> so <laughs> they will not be thinking about this mm -hmm. uh, in eighteen months. Um, Angie, anything to add there about what you see with more of the Republican base? Even though I know that's that's not usually your target audience. No, although. Honestly, we spend a lot of time looking at them um, because they are the ones that uh, uh, we care about from a persuasion standpoint and agree with everything Robert said. There is a very strong cross-partisan appeal here um, on this issue, 
especially compared to, to anything else. Um, so I, I haven't seen backlash, nor am I worried about it. And that goes to your point maybe about the insulation um, that they created by including some other things that Republicans yeah. don't want to talk about more in the bill or um, making sure that it couldn't be caricatured as, as a gun grab. No. Mm -hmm. um, so we also have a, a question in the chat um, about a topic that is, is frequently discussed after we see these horrific mass shootings, which is assault weapons. And we know that the um, you know, the, the public conversation so often focuses on, um, on assault weapons in, in the wake of horrible um, ma massacres um, because those are the weapons that are almost always used in, in those real mass shootings that just shock the conscience. So I'm curious, you know, obviously um, the assault weapons ban was not in any part of the discussion around a bipartisan bill, but do you see, you know, any opportunity for progress around um, high-powered um, weapons or, you know, large magazines or any of those things um, that we could at least take small steps on as we continue to see them used in these horrific ways? I think it's going to be a real challenge for Republican elected officials to ever get behind anything that, to your point, would be seen as limiting gun ownership you know, as a result of kind of the steadfast support of a, you know, broad interpretation of the Second Amendment by most Republican voters, right? Um, even trying to limit assault weapons, you know, for those under 21 kind of ended up falling out of this for that reason. I do think there is, you know, uh, Republicans are very concerned, Republican elected officials and voters perhaps about a slippery slope, right? Allowing any infringement on gun ownership would continue progress towards, you know, further infringements. And so I think that would require, you know, sort of a 2008, 2009, you know, uh, uh, legislative makeup, you know, with 60 Democrats in the Senate and, the, and a Democratic majority in the House in order to get that done. I think that'd be a, a really difficult, even in a limited way, um, with, a, with less than 60 votes in the Senate. Yeah, I think this is a, um, uh, Robert's actually absolutely right in the, the po ch po political challenges uh, of it. I think this is a very good example of where the voters are ahead of our leaders. Um, you know, I've done multiple focus groups where there are uh, people in camouflage right out of central casting um, hunters uh, who are like, why do I need assault weapon to hunt deer? It doesn't make any sense. Like they're, they do not get the need for these types of guns, even if they don't know all the details about what makes them assault weapons, they get that they are designed to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible and belong on war fields. So um, there is a sense that they are unneeded. Now where we get into a little bit of a challenge, and I think this speaks to the, the uh, political dynamics that Robert was talking about, um, is that voters do fundamentally believe that the hardware of a gun isn't as big of a problem as the person who holds it. Uh, and so when you start to have conversations about banning certain types of guns, you get into a little bit of a gray area there where, um, yes, you know, they're, they're with us on polls and they'll talk about how we don't need them. Um, but they do sort of feel this little bit of a slippery slope that Robert was talking to. So I do think it's something that voters want. Uh, and again, if we were just thinking about things that could you know, pass nationally, this would definitely be one of them, but it gets more complicated when you're starting to talk about the hardware. You know, Angie, one thing that I've noticed as someone who works with a lot of um, Democrats who are in, you know, kind of red or purple districts um, is actually the shift within the Democratic Party on this issue over the past few years. You know, when we um, when we were working um, post Sandy Hook to try to get a series of reforms through, um, background checks um, didn't even have um, all the Democrats in the caucus on board. So Robert's, uh, you know, magic 60 Democrats wouldn't have even got us there um, on background checks, let alone on assault weapons, which if I recall, got something in the low 40s, um, even, even in a Senate that had a lot more Democrats than we do now. What do you think um, has accounted for that shift in the Democratic Party? Because, you know, we saw the House, for example, pass the assault weapons ban easily this time, even though Nancy Pelosi has a very narrow majority and we have a lot of folks that are facing really tough um, districts this year um, and either unanimous or near unanimous support um, for a straight up assault weapons bans. What, what, what is happening there? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it goes to um, what I spoke to early on, on like what has changed in the mindsets and emotions of voters. Um, Democrats, certainly, but not just, just not just them, a lot of um, suburban voters, as Robert talked about, too. Um, there is a sense that like something has to be done. There is a, like I said, the, the emotions have shifted and, and we, we track this, we talk to people like post mass shootings, it's not just sadness anymore. There's certainly sadness for victims, but there is a real tangible anger at the lack of action um, that certainly translates to increased policy support on a, on a poll. And, and there's an increasing awareness and education of people, of voters, um, that our lax gun laws are a real, real problem. There just wasn't that sense before. There wasn't a sense that like any changes in the law could do anything. Um, and now you still see like some skepticism that changes in the law could make huge impacts, but there is a really realization that something can be done and it doesn't have to be like this um, moving forward. And I would hope that, you know, there is a reduction in mass shootings um, as a result of this law. I think there will certainly be an impact, but I, you know, uh, am also aware that there's likely to be more mass shootings, right? And those events tend to be galvanizing. And as much as I hope that this bill solves everything, I'm, I, I think that's unlikely. Um, and so, you know, you're going to see as we go forward, you know, these happen with a uh, disheartening regularity. Um, and I expect that, you know, it will take, you know, more events and, you know, more of these things to engage voters and elected officials to move forward. That's really what, yes, what's changed, you know, between 1993 and, you know, the Brady Bill and now, and it's probably a, a horrific number of mass shootings is the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah certainly uh, that is one piece. I know, you know, another piece I often point to is the changing party coalitions, you know, uh, when, when I got to DC in 2006, there were a fair amount of Democrats that were endorsed by the NRA, including um, you know, folks from some pretty rural areas. And, um, and that really changed around 2014 after, after the Sandy Hook conversation. And um, even the Democrats that didn't um, vote for the background checks bill, uh, they, were, they had their Republican opponents endorsed by the NRA instead of them. And so I think it, it also made it clear that uh, to Democrats that there was no amount of um, kowtowing to the NRA that was going to get them that endorsement. And, you know, and now we see people um, like Abigail Spanberger in, in a more suburban district rather than somebody like Bart Stupak in the upper peninsula, peninsula of Michigan. And that that changes the dynamic as well. Um, I, I feel like we've answered part of this question, and, but I'll give you another shot at it just because this person has um, put so many facts in this question that I feel like I need to read them. <laughs> this, uh, do you think this will be the last federal gun bill for 30 years? Um, that's been the history in the past. We had uh, 1934, 1968, 1993, um, and now today. And um, I, I love that they went back all the way to 1934 because that seems like uh, <laughs> a lot has changed since then. But um, but that does seem like the cadence, I guess, now is every 30 years. Um, do you have hope that, that we're going to break that cadence this time? I hope so. But I, you know, I, I don't know the answer. Right. I mean, I think that all of those, uh, although I will not claim to have much knowledge about the 1934 bill, all those other bills, you know, have direct kind of historical correlations to big events, right? So it would suggest that there would be another big event, you know, 30 years in the future that would require more. And, it, and again, it just sort of depends on what impact this has, you know, right? I mean, you can see already, you know, just to take another issue that like, I think is a good, you know, uh, approximator for this, which is, you know, the, Amer the Affordable Care Act in, in 2009 to solve healthcare, and we're here in 2022, and I don't think anybody thinks healthcare is solved, and I think there'll be a lot, you know, there was a prescription drug pricing bill that just passed, um, there were a bunch of other things that are going to come forward on healthcare, so I think it's going, you know, I, I think if there, if this bill solves everything for 30 years, that's great. Um, and maybe it will take 30 years, but I expect that there'll be kind of more incremental moves um, as when the parties take power, they look to move forward on big priorities, knowing that they have a short time of power, right? That's another thing I think has changed um, in terms of legislative control is that the 
the, the leaders in the Senate and the House are much more purposeful about the, you know, maybe 18 months is all they have, right, of actionable time um, in charge and moving things forward. And I think there will be a lot more purpose around that um, going forward. Um, I'm usually the least optimistic person in the room, but um, I, I don't think that's the end for 30 years. Um, and voters aside, frankly, I think the political players have changed. Um, the NRA just, partially from its own complete ineptness, um, is not the same powerhouse that it used to be in terms of its ability to uh, really come in and defend um, or support candidates in terms of spending power uh, on elections. We now have uh, funding private jets. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they I forgot mean, to do their electoral spending. I, I, certainly, the movement can take some credit in uh, discrediting them, but they, for lack of a better term, shot themselves in the own foot uh, multiple times over the last uh, few years. So they're diminishing in power. And at a certain point, our leaders are going to recognize that and have started to already. And then you have the rise of, you know, Giffords in every town and people who are spending massively um, in these political races uh, to defend um, and support people who go out on a limb and, and uh, protect uh, uh, gun reform or support gun reform. So I think the players are changing uh, and the politics of that are changing. And so that gives me some hope that, um, uh, we're not going to have to wait another 30 years for something. Uh, now, what that next something is and how big is it, it is, I do not know. Uh, but but I think it will come. I can attest that Angie is usually uh, the <laughs> pessimist in the room when it comes to Congress actually doing something. Uh, so I'm, I'm heartened to hear that. Uh, <laughs> you're right. The movement has changed radically. You know, when um, Sandy Hook happened, most of those organizations didn't even exist. And now right. they, they have so much power and so much um, reach into American voters that really care about this. So mm -hmm. uh, we only have a minute left. Um, just want to close with asking you to kind of switch hats. And if you were having to advise a Democratic candidate on this issue, Robert, or if you were trying to advise a, a Republican candidate on this issue, Angie, what, what, what would your biggest piece of advice be for the other side? What do you wish that the other side knew that you see in your research? Uh, mine would be that uh, encouraging, uh, you know, I think Senator Murphy and other people have probably done this well, reminding people about the, what I think is really a limited electoral risk um, in these bills, right? Um, I don't think Republicans hear that enough. Um, the elected officials, you know, from polling data um, from their voters, right? If, if there is really a limited, and I think this is a good use case for it to show people, there's just really a limited electoral risk um, in supporting reasonable um, and constitutional gun reforms. Yeah, um, I would say to, to anyone of either party, Republican, Democrat, otherwise, that I, I certainly understand um, that voters can be fickle. Uh, and lawmakers know that, right? That they can say, voters can say something on a poll, but when it comes to how it will de be deployed um, in a campaign communications context, an attack on the campaign, that that is often a different story. So, um, but I think that they should know that the hits for opposing these types of measures are, and going against the will of the people um, on both sides of the political spectrum has become a far greater vulnerability uh, mm -hmm. than being perceived as being quote unquote soft on gun rights. Um, and they do themselves, Republicans, Democrats, they do themselves a much greater service and they put themselves in a much better electoral position um, if they are pro some gun reform, and I'm being generous, you don't have to be pro everything, right? Um, I understand that there's lines in the sand for people, and that's fine. Um, so I would say you can really, really trust the data tier. You can trust that times have changed on this. Americans have evolved and changed on this. Um, if you don't believe me, like, every, you know, most members of Congress have a pollster like me or Robert, right? Ask them to go do focus groups uh, in your district, in your community. And even stack it, you know, make it all gun owners, right? And ask them how they feel about these issues. And I, I, I'm 100% certain you'll be surprised at how open they are to, to doing something on gun violence. Well, thank you so much for uh, both of your work on, on this issue uh, and for sharing your time with us today. And here's hoping that we can get back for a celebratory, how did we get that one done uh, discussion about the next bill in less than 30 years. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.